Great, and I think we are live. Brilliant. I'm just going to wait to see a few people join. Hopefully, if we've got the technology correct. Um, if you are watching this, please, and you can see us, just type hi in the comments box so that we know that someone's watching. <laughs> um, hold on, let me type in. Hello. Um, yay, we've got one person so far. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Hi Claire. Hi Natasha. Thanks for joining us. Vera's in. So as that's slowly filling up, it's lovely. Great, thank you. And you can hear us okay as well. Brilliant. Great. So this is the team. Say hi, team. Um, hi. Not a shy team today. Um, we're going to get into this now as people start joining. Um, and just to make it easier on the eye, I might be shifting the view around a little bit. Hopefully that will make it easier for people watching on uh, their phones. Um, hopefully it will work. We've not used this uh, software before. So let's see what happens. How does that work? Hopefully that works. Um, so listen, welcome everyone. Uh, and welcome to this first Barbara Payne Society social media live. Thank you for joining us. We are super excited about this series of live streams. We're going to be running two of these a month where you'll hear from different pelvic health experts. It's for health professionals, patients, partners, anyone who has an interest in learning more about vulval pain. More on the series in a little while. Today, you're going to be meeting all of us, the v VPS team, as we reflect upon the journey so far. So some of the key Vulval Pain Society achievements, uh, useful resources we already have in place that you can access and read. And what we've got planned to help you perhaps a little bit better in 2021. We're only a small team of five people, and we thought we'd start off this series by sharing a little bit about each one of us, our backgrounds, and in particular what we're excited about, what we've got coming off, um, coming up. So I'm going to kick off. Uh, I'm Sharon Goulbert, for those of you who don't know me. I've been a trustee since 2019. I actually heard about the VPS uh, probably towards the, the late stages of my journey through unprovoked vulvodynia. Um, I only wish I'd found out about the VPS sooner. At its worst, it was 10 years at its worst, my vulvodynia, until I found the right mix of multidisciplinary care uh, for me to personally break free. I then retrained as a cognitive hypnotherapist and my interest in pain biology sees me immersed in ooh, a beautiful mix of pain science books, forums, webinars and other events pretty much on a daily basis. Um, if you're on Twitter at the moment, if we have some interactions, that's probably going to be with me. Um, so in autumn 2019, the team uh, who at the time roped me in to being MC at the Vulval Pain Conference. But completely unexpectedly, I've never done anything like that before. Um, we will speak a little bit later about the Vulval Pain Conference and what that entails. That is going to be a continuing role for me, it seems, as MC. I also organise and host the online events, so the webinars and uh, these social media lives. You will find around about, I think, yeah, 10 recorded webinars. 
on our YouTube channel already um, and we'll post up a link to those a little bit later. Uh, so if there, there are any technical hitches today, that is going to be down to me. <laughs> so please forgive me if that happens. I've got an eye on a number of things, comments coming in, everyone on screen. And so if I'm looking around a little bit, forgive me. I'm also a little bit excited. Um, so at the VPS, we know the importance of the patient voice. So I'd like to introduce a really important member of our team. And to make this easier, I'm just going to pop a couple of you in the background and then here we go. Kay Thomas, yay! Hi. 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 Kay is operations director and importantly, she's an expert patient. Um, Kay, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about your background? Um, my background in vulval pain, I started suffering in 1996, literally overnight. Um, and I was very lucky that after about um, a year, ooh, a year sounds a long time, um, one of the doctors pointed me to the London vulval pain support group. Um, and I went along to those meetings and that literally saved my life. I was really, really down at the time. Through the London Vulval Pain Support Group, I heard about David Nunns, who'd started the Vulval Pain Society. And they said, oh, he's ever so nice. So I thought, well, let's get him down and, and have him talk to the girls. And we did. And he was so lovely and we kept in touch. And then I became involved with helping David with the Vulval Pain Society. Um, which uh, eventually led to us um, setting up a charity of which you now part. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and Kay, you also played a part in starting the conferences, didn't you? Yes. David had already been doing um, with Fabio at the time um, workshops throughout the country. So they would uh -huh. pick a town. Um, have a venue like a friend's meeting house and the local ladies and partners would come along. Um, but what I was always concerned about was doctors have these conferences and they talk about, you know, the scientific medical um, issues that affect us, but there was no trickle down to us, nothing fed back to the patients. And I soon realised when I tried to attend a few conferences that it was an absolute no, no, patients were just not welcome at conferences. Uh, to be fair, I understand that um, one or two patients had, you know, caused a bit of a rumpus <laughs> at a conference, and so it was sort of frowned upon. So I wanted to bring the two together. I wanted to have a conference-type event venue with doctors, health professionals, physiotherapists, chiropractors, uh, um, sexual, um, sociosexual um, counsellors, sorry, um, I'm nervous. <laughs> and just to have a situation where normal patients could hear these professionals speak and interact. And also, actually, for the professionals, it was maybe the first time they were meeting patients outside of uh, a consultation. So everybody was seeing a slightly different side to the other. Um, and they've been really successful. I'm, I'm really thrilled with the way that's worked out. It's a really important event, isn't it? Having health professionals and patients come together in one place. It's so, so powerful. And um, having been to a few of these now over the years, even before I became trustee, it's that dialogue is so important and that contact, you know, and, and then working out what might be a, a best course of treatment for you becomes a little bit easier because you can speak to so many different health professionals from different disciplines. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we've also in, always invited health professionals to the conferences and the GU physicians have been really supportive um, as of physiotherapists, actually. So it's been brilliant. I've had such positive feedback after each conference from patients, their partners, 
as well as all the health professionals, um, the speakers, as well as the ones attending the conference. So um, we were due to have one in London last October, but due to COVID, we've had to postpone that. Um, they've only really, the event organisers have only really allowed us to, to postpone till this October this year. So keep, please keep an eye on the website because that will be a fluid situation depending on the current situation. Yeah. If it comes to the worst, it's going to have to be an online event. Yeah. And look, if it's not in London, it will be online. And hopefully yeah. that means more people can join as well. Yeah. Um, a question here uh, asking uh, whether there is going to be another event at the Liverpool Women's Hospital in the future. But I think the answer to that is watch this space, isn't it? Yes, I mean, we, we, we would love to go back to, to doing, you know, three, three workshops, maybe four throughout the country in a year. And then the large conferences, maybe every two years, because they do require a lot of money and a lot of planning. So as soon as COVID is done and dusted with us and we are safe to move around, that's definitely one thing I'll be planning. Mm. Mm. Um, we've got a, a comment from a physio come in saying that how much physios learn uh, as well from these collaborative events with patients, because ultimately that's right. The patients are the real experts. That's so yeah. Important. And I think physiotherapy has really become one of the go to treatments at the moment. And I have to say hats off to them. The physiotherapists I know have really run with this. They are start taking their studies very seriously. They're doing a lot of research and they're looking at the whole woman when they're treating somebody. It's not just this muscle or that muscle. People might think physiotherapy is, is sort of very definite, but they actually very holistic. Um, so um, watch the space for future lives with physiotherapists Ooh, yes. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll be mentioning that in a little yeah. while. And so as well as the conference, there are a number of other firsts as well, aren't there? Um, yes. When I, when I got this, I was like, we don't have a patient information leaflet. And everybody that I knew and in, uh, you know, said, you can't have one. And I was like, why not? And they were like, no, oh, you just can't. So I thought, well, you can. Um, and David agreed to help us, bless you. And with the girls at the London Vulva Pain Support Group, we produced a general vulvodynia leaflet, which I feel kind of validates people that they can say, you know, this is a little leaflet uh, about our condition. Uh, doctors can use it in their clinics. It's a patient information leaflet. My GP displays it in his surgery. Um, thank you, Dr. Lloyd. <laughs> and um, you know, so so that was the first. That was the first Vulvodynia general leaflet, which you can email the Vulval Pain Society, and I will post you out a bunch, or you can download them from the website. We produced again with the London Vulval Pain Support Group, uh, with the input of physiotherapists, midwives, doctors, patients, a smears without tears leaflet. And um, this is some hints for ladies who find smears painful, and hopefully they will help you have a better experience because smears are important and can save lives. Yeah. Um, so I've just posted up and we've got someone in the background also, we're going to chat about in a moment, also posting up links. Um, so there'll be links on both YouTube and Facebook to both of those leaflets um, that can be downloaded. And as Kay said, if you um, are in a clinic and you'd like the physical leaflets in batches then just get in touch with us info at valvalpainsociety.org and Kay will send out a, a batch to you um, we're only too happy to do that really yeah um, again such important leaflets I, I wish that I'd come across them uh, when I was going through my worst. Um, so, so important. Um, so I mentioned there's someone in the background on Facebook also um, commenting, and that's Catherine, who's in the background, uh, a little bit camera shy, and that's okay. Um, and Catherine is a uh, invaluable and long-term member of the VPS team. Um, she's also an expert patient, really important for us to have that viewpoint um, and she's been instrumental in putting so many things together hasn't she? Um, Absolutely, Catherine does the bulk of running the website 
um, uh, and without Catherine, we we just we really we we we, we would not be here. Uh, we are having an exciting revamp as we speak of our website. Uh, so the new website is going to be tremendous, and um, much of that is down to Catherine. So thank you, Catherine. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Catherine. We really appreciate all the effort <laughs> and all the, oh, the God, kind yes. of oh, the tears and the effort and the yeah it's just it's it's so intensive to take a website of our size and all the resources we have on it and put it into a new framework um so we are excited about that revamp watch this space it's going to be a fresh look it will also be friendlier across devices um and it's important to Hi, mention that yeah. yeah yeah carry on it's important to mention that, 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 web, that, web, that website of ours we inherited from a sufferer who um, I don't have a permission so I won't say her name but she set up a little website when the internet had just started like not everybody had a computer and it was given to us as a gift and it's really kind of just stayed like that so the revamp is well overdue um, and you know it's really exciting and well done expert patient for setting up in the first place and, and we've built upon that yeah um, I know that okay um so i was gonna say catherine is a volunteer and of course you know that you know as trustees we're all you know we're volunteers and catherine is a volunteer as well so you know we're a small charity there's five of us um and generally, you know, we're all involved in uh, wearing other hats as well. Um, and we'll hear from Winston and David in a moment. And I, I kind of, I'm a therapist as well. Um, and so we put in the time that we can into this charity. So, you know, we've got the conference leaflets, updating resources, meeting editorial requests that come in and we've got a quick turnaround sometimes on on those requests that come in um and then all the other bits we need in the background uh so you know the software for this that we're using today hardware so talk to us very quickly Kay, about how we're funded we are not funded. Uh, well, we have a, a very kindly a, an annual grant from the BSSVD, which is the British Society for the Study of Vulvar Vaginal Diseases, and that is extremely welcome. We, many years ago, used to have quite a, a bit of our income come from our handbook sales. Uh, mm. This actually needs a, a good overhaul, and that will be next on the cards. But mm. I think with everything going digital, the handbook sales have really um, slowed down. So um, we, we don't really have fundings. We rely on donations. Um, and there is one kind lady who, again, I don't have permission to say her name, but she she does a small annual events for us and, and kindly supports us. You know who you are. <laughs> and thank you so much for your support. Um, we might put up a link later on in the comments about how you can donate if, if you choose to. Um, so Kay, um, well, someone's just said the website is so amazingly useful. I'm excited to see the revamp. We're excited oh, too. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. And it's um, Catherine who's doing the donkey's work on that website. So thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Um, Kay, just very quickly, tell me what you are most looking forward to this year in terms of... Well, normally I would have said the conference because I love them. I love meeting people. I love doing live. I love seeing them. I love seeing people who maybe have never spoken about Old Virginia to anyone else. Meet other women with it. And, and, and at lunchtime, they all, you know, it's just like unbelievable. The atmosphere is so... Uh, overwhelmingly you know exciting but with COVID I'm a bit nervous so um, I'll have to go with our new trustee Winston DeMillo, Dr DeMillo who is just the most fantastic resource that has come to us and we are just so grateful I am so excited with the projects um, and the expertise he'll be bringing to the society we are very lucky to have Winston Ah, oh, lucky. Yes. Thank you, Kay. And um, you'll all get to meet Winston in a short while. Um, but first of all, um, 
I want to introduce uh, my fellow trustee and founder of the VPS. So Kay, I'm going to pop you into the background just so that it makes it easier for people on mobile yeah. devices to, to see the screen. And I'm going to add David in. David, hi. Um, David is the founder of the Vulval Pain Society, and we're ever so grateful for everything that he does and for setting this amazing charity up in, in the first place. David, do you want to tell us first of all a little bit about your background and your experience? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so my background is a, is, is a medic and I qualified in 91. I went straight into obstetrics and gynaecology as, as my chosen specialty. And I had time out in 94 to carry out a research degree, which uh, was in a sexual health uh, clinic. And uh, I, I was interested to the Volvo, the Volvo clinic, uh, which was a sort of new concept back then. And uh, my consultant supervisor uh, said, this is, this is your clinic to, to, to manage the women that we have who get referred to us. And uh, they've got uh, the women have got all sorts of vulnerable problems, and uh, you can write an MD on 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 the on these patients that come through to the clinic. So that's what I did for a year and a half, and then very quickly I realised there was a problem. Uh, I, I I in my MD I searched the literature, I searched textbooks, I uh, there was nothing really in the UK in terms of research. There was some very awkward research carried out in the 1980s in the States um, that I, I, I didn't feel was um, very robust in terms of uh, uh, research methodology. Some women have got, had, who had treatments had very short follow-up periods. Some women had very inappropriate, I thought was inappropriate treatments. Uh, with surgery, etc., cetera, for, for, for vulval pain. And um, there was this big gap in the UK of understanding what is vulval pain, what the cause is, what's the assessment, et cetera. So very little in, 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 in the medical literature and just in general. And I had this clinic of women, clinic uh, of, of many patients, half of, half of whom had a pain syndrome. And myself and Diane Hamdi, who was the nurse in the clinic, realized, who was the co-founder actually of, of, the, of the group, realized that we needed to do something. It just seemed morally the right thing to do to get to start some form of awareness really of this condition. Because I had the basics in my understanding of this condition. I mean, I mean, back then there was a very, um, very, very, doctor-led approach to managing problems it was doctor tells patient patient takes drug a b c cream a b patient gets better patient's discharge and it was quite a, a one it was a quite a binary approach to different clinical problems of which pain was vulva pain was included so i realized quite quickly that this was more complex and through networking um uh with with with, with patient with with small patient groups like Kay's group in London I realized that actually there were many facets to this uh, this condition vulvodynia um, it was complex it was a, a variety of women and there was a whole host of interventions that either in isolation or together that would work so it was sort of I was always engaged by working with Kay and and, and all the other women I met at workshops and realized that actually there was a there was a big piece of work here to do in terms of general awareness in our population. Um, and that was magazines that was on, on radio four. I went on radio four with Fabio and we talked about the vulva, um, um, women's hour. We went, we had local TV. We had lots of things to, to, to raise awareness. Um, and, and then there were the workshops, there was the handbook. So we were just slowly, I was feeding off, the women with their stories and and they were getting the information from us from myself the medics who were slowly coming on board and it just it just has just spiraled since then and i think now we've got a um a much better 
relationship between the health professionals and patients. We don't have all the answers, but there is, I feel there's more of a listening type, a listening relationship between patients and doctors and other health professionals and a sense of shared decision making to coin a phrase, which is what we use in medicine a lot, giving people options. Unless a dogmatic approach from telling patients to try A, B and C and then just discharging them. And I think pain syndromes is a, a really good, although we use the word vulvodynia, it was very uh, helpful for me to understand because it's a syndrome, a collection of symptoms. And I realized uh, through meeting other health professionals and women that there were lots of opportunities uh, for women to try, lots of various um, uh, interventions like that, acupuncture, physiotherapy, whatever, drugs, medications to try. And it, it did, things did seem to work. And that was the reason for the group, really, to just to promote the, 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 the health, physical, mental health of the women um, through education and understanding uh, and also public uh, awareness as well. We, we, I think we've, we're doing well. We've, we've got the health professionals on board. I think we around the UK, they, they generally are. They're quite supportive of, of working with us because for some women, it is a difficult problem. We, 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 we can't easily find solutions and cures to for some women but we you know we can work towards improving things should i say mm, yeah and you know what kay was talking about earlier we're kind of closing that gap aren't we between health professionals and patients and fostering that kind of dialogue between them which is so important and in terms of your current role what would you say your I suppose uh, one of your key roles is at the moment within the Vival Pain Society. So, yes, good question. <laughs> I mean, I, I consider myself a medical a medical advisor, and um, the, the the sort of clinical face of the of the society uh, uh, with Winston. I mean, we are we are qualified medics, so there are there are there are clinical issues that we are happy to give guidance on um, and that's 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 often, I think that's that's often very credible for a, a, a patient support group to have that I think that, that gives us some sense of um, uh, credibility I guess because we we do you know we are as being qualified and seeing women we do uh, try and give that medical advice it's not always uh, specific advice to an individual it can be quite general advice sometimes i mean the the, yes. the other the other the other work we do is um uh is is a lot of networking with other health professionals so we speak at conferences we, we always mention the vulval pain society in my other hat with the vssvd we work closely together and um and i'm just with the i'm just with the team uh, uh, just working forwards trying to to continue to raise awareness and um, promotion of vulvodynia. Yeah. And one thing I've got to mention about David is whenever we have a team meeting, David joins us from the hospital because he's still working. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much every time, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you are super busy and you also devote your time to um, getting the word out and encouraging this relationship between health professionals and patients. Um, and we, we really kind of value, you know, the guidance and your knowledge um, on this. So in terms of what's coming up this year, David, what, um, what are you particularly excited about in terms of the projects we're, we're working on this year? Well, I think, I think there's a greater need to work on the the aims and objectives of the society because of COVID. Um, this is a, a, a significant challenge to our services. Uh, a, a reduction in face-to-face -face consultations, a, um, uh, a, te a telephone consultations are tricky. And a lot of my colleagues do not like telephone consultations. They'd rather see 
their patients face to face. Some of my colleagues do find it very useful, but um, that's that's going to be difficult for a woman with a vulval problem where th there is so much in the doctor health professional patient relationship that is seen face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that makes it optimal. When it's on the phone, it's not quite optimal. Um, I mean, some of my colleagues might disagree with that, but you can't examine the patient, you can't look at, at skin lesions, etc. So I think we've got to we've got to get through this pandemic in many ways and think about and, and still have this promotion of self-care and signposting people. The workshop, I hope, will be a, a culmination of meeting, understanding, having a some sense of understanding where we might be. I hope women come to that workshop so we can really understand where we are with vulvodynia at, at, at this moment in time. Yeah. I've got patients who are quite frightened of coming to hospitals, so I've noticed a quite a few don't come. Um, so I don't, you know, we haven't quite unpicked COVID pandemic and the a woman with vulvodynia. Um, so I... I don't have the true answer to that question, um, Sharon, but I'm, 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 there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done, yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a comment here saying, I've been really blessed as I've had surgery and been seen by my gynaecologist every three to four weeks all through COVID at the Liverpool Women's Hospital. So I just do a shout out there for the Liverpool Women's Hospital. Um, and someone's saying, I wish GPs had a better understanding. Too many times I I felt let down by them. And actually part of our role is to educate as well, um, educate the public, certainly. Um, and in, you know, your your role is, is also educating kind of health professionals, medics. Um, so they that first line care um, and signposting is better. So what, what we've done in parallel, what I do in parallel with the BSSVD, which is the medical society for, for, for health professionals, is we have developed a, an, a, a, a job description and a, 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 what we call a knowledge, skills, competency package, i.e. a package of education for a dermatologist to uh, be appointed to, to run a, a Volvo service. And that will include working with in a multidisciplinary team and also we are working with gynecologists we've set that up that's been in place for, for many years now to again leaders within the vulval service to work not in isolation within um and work in multidisciplinary teams we're also working with commissioners who pay for pay all the bills they pay the doctors uh, hospital bills um they've got the cash working with them to try and set up what we would call um a hub and spoke network where you've got the hub as the sort of perhaps the, 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 com the more complex cases and the spoke which might deal with um, uh, less complex cases in a network but the key thing everyone's working together so complex physiotherapy may be for example offered only in one hospital and not another but you would have in your region an ability to refer from one to the other psychosexual therapy pain management services so these are the this is quite exciting and this is what i'm trying to set up this year we are we've already made good conversations with them and so the the, the role of the vps and other patient groups into that process is absolutely crucial it's definitely a doctor health professional patient relationship in that work yeah absolutely brilliant thank you so much david for giving us a, a, a small view into the many things that we that we do um, you'll be hearing from David uh, a little bit more in the next social media live and I'll tell you uh, more about that in a little while um, thank you David I'm just going to pop you into the background <laughs> one oh. day I'll get really smooth at this <laughs> Um, and I want to introduce the newest member of our team, Dr. Winston DeMello. Um, Winston, you were appointed as trustee in October 2020. We were super excited. <laughs> um, tell us uh, a little bit uh, about yourself, for those of you who don't already know you, um, about your background and your experience. Well, good evening, Sharon, and uh, good evening to everybody who's listening to this uh, podcast.
podcast. It's uh, quite an exciting venture. Um, I uh, joined the army to finance my way through medical school. And when I qualified in 1978, um, the, it was the time when the Women's Royal Army Corps was disbanded. And so women were now serving in, uh, in uh, military institutions. And I found myself as a very junior military doctor having to deal with women's health. Um, which I knew very little about. My postgraduate training uh, to be a, a, a general practitioner, a GP, uh, involved six months in obstetrics and gynecology and six months in dermatology. And that's what triggered my fascination with vulval pain. Because if I talked to the dermatologist, he had a different classification and a different approach. And if I spoke to the uh, gynecologist, remember this was the early 80s, uh, he said, oh, it's, it's simple, it's psychosomatic, and just shrugged his shoulders. So I was lucky in that respect that I, I, I started seeing things from different perspectives. By accident, uh, I, I stopped my career in general practice and uh, moved to anesthesia and pain medicine. And pelvic pain became the, the taboo area of pain medicine. Nobody liked dealing with it because something down below, um, it... Uh, it wasn't very popular, but I soon realized it was very uh, traumatizing um, for the patients, both male and female. Um, and I just didn't comprehend the complexity of it. So this has been a long journey. For the last 24 years, I've been a consultant in pelvic pain medicine, um, most recently in Manchester. And I decided, well, if I don't understand it, I need to speak to other professionals. And that's how I came across David Nunn's. And I learned a lot from the British Society of Vulval Vaginal Diseases and started taking a, an interest in the subject and realized I knew a little of, uh, of so many things. Uh, I ran a pelvic pain clinic together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Viawai at Manchester at a, a multidisciplinary team, specialist nurses, uh, pelvic pain physiotherapist and vulval pain was a big component of that group of pelvic pain patients and it's fascinating because it occurs at a young age uh, it sort of peaks between 18 to 25 and the needs of a young girl are very different from a, a, a patient with vulval pain who wants better sexual health or wants to get pregnant or, or that uh, patient who is men perimenopausal and has vulval pain. So it's, it's not a, a straightforward thing. And as a result, I decided uh, to embark on my diploma in psychosexual medicine three years ago. So I'm due my exams this uh, June, just to try and understand the impact of uh, pain on sexual health. And then we had COVID last year, which destroyed uh, lots of people's plans. And because of my age and because of my high risk, and as David talked to you about face-to-face -face consultations, I found myself doing uh, video conferencing calls. I did 135 pelvic pain patients in three months. And I got used to the idea, the limitations, but what you missed out was the sort of body language, the, 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 the behavior, the, the use of words, it was a bit stilted. Hmm. But as the year got on and the, the COVID um, pandemic uh, was, was getting more and more difficult to predict, um, after discussion with my wife, I decided to retire. Uh, and I retired in September and I was very pleased uh, to be offered uh, this post as a trustee with the Vulval Pain Society, partly because of the fun I had on the road shows. I did the Liverpool Women's, uh, the Manchester, and in 2019, the Leeds. And it's fun because you learn a lot from other people and you learn from patients. So patients are, are a big source of education for me. Mm. Uh, so that's really how, how I accidentally drifted into pelvic pain medicine and vulval pain. Mm, very happily for us too. Um, so 
Winston, you're working on a key project for us this year. You've got a key focus this year. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about that? Because I was working in an adult practice, um, we rarely saw patients below the age of 18 unless there were very special circumstances. And mm -hmm. the has got so specialised and with the th issues like safeguarding, etc., anybody who's below that age um, uh, tends to be in that transitional stage uh, where there is no seamless care. And it struck me that if you're a young girl with vulval pain and there isn't that smooth transition through your teens and then through your, uh, your uh, younger years, uh, your problems can magnify, uh, not just medically, but psychosocially, financially, professionally. And I just thought, wouldn't it be nice to, to hit the problem right at the beginning? And so I became aware, mainly because of parents ringing me about their uh, uh, daughters with vulval pain. And I realized I knew very little about it, other than the fact that in America, for example, my sister works in Florida as a practice nurse, and she runs an adolescent clinic, and she sees lots of young girls with vulval pain. So I think it's just the way medicine's practiced. Um, we don't understand um, the, the impact it has on the very young. So my focus uh, is really to try and update information for patients and their parents for, and younger women for patients, the families and partners to try and bring in all the information from North America or other uh, centers of excellence, and not just from a, from a pain perspective, but also from a multidisciplinary perspective, like what, what can you do if you are struggling at school, for example, you know, uh, what kind of agencies can we um, uh, tap into? So I'm really trying to use the next year to try and bring together the, the, the strands, consult patients, consult the parents, partners, see what uh, their needs had been during their journey and what would they really like to have had if they had the time again in that, in that uh, medical journey. So that is the, really the focus and um, I'm, I get more nervous talking about it because it's a huge, huge subject because you've got to understand the psychology, the dermatology, the gynecology, the pain medicines, the genital urinary medicines, the list just goes on and on. And so I'm hoping that with these regular podcasts, we're going to be having um, the Devalval Pain Society, getting other experts in and mm -hmm. getting feedback from our listeners. Maybe we'll be able to build a jigsaw puzzle up and be able to put in the missing pieces so that we get a better picture and a better sort of understanding as to what we can best do for a, uh, for our pa uh, patients with uh, vulval pain. Yeah, and so we have better informed clinicians as a result. That's what we're aiming for, aren't we? Great. Yeah. So also a hopefully provide information for health professionals as well. So it's not just patients. I hope that to be able to use use that same time spent looking at the literature and the evidence to also highlight key articles, key sources of information, evidence-based mm. medicine, because that's what we have to practice, um, and uh, ma make sure we act like a network. As David said, it's, it's very difficult to run a service if you're not financed, and financing is, is a big um, limiting factor from what we would like in the ideal world. So this is one of the reasons why uh, I vol uh, agreed to being a trustee because um, I, I, it just allows me that transition from working to, to retirement um, yeah. to sort of uh, put down on paper um, the benefits of experience of having to deal with these conditions. Mm. Yeah. It's important work, and it, as you say, it's, it's a huge project, um, and so so overdue. Um, 
And, you know, there are people writing into the comments. Uh, there's a lady here, I've been dealing with pelvic pain for 12 years and have gotten worse. I feel like I've done everything and my doctors just aren't digging anymore. Um, uh, she's in Canada, so, you know, um, she's not happy about the, the treatment or the lack of treatment that, that she's had. And ultimately, we're, we're looking at, again, we were talking about the jigsaw, aren't we? And it's finding that jigsaw of different therapies, multidisciplinary care that might work for the individual person. It usually is. There's no one size fits all. Um, and um, there isn't one particular therapy that we would recommend because it, it's absolutely dependent on, on the individual. Isn't I think it? you're right. I think it's important to, um, just if you just take vulval pain, uh, normally a pain, a pelvic pain physician um, would not see a patient with bubble pain directly unless other reasons, uh, 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 what we call red flags, diseases have been excluded. And that's where the gynecologist, the vulval dermatologist will come into it. We see, uh, we see the vulvodynias, i.e. Mm. those group of patients with bubble pain for which there is no ex um, explanation with current knowledge although it's increasing uh, as we go along. And it's sad to hear about this, uh, uh, this listener from Canada because as you've uh, stressed, even in best pain um, outcomes, 30% improvement is regarded as a good outcome. So I think it's setting your expectations lower in terms of pain and concentrating on function and quality of life. And uh, I think in, in, in the next uh, podcast, uh, we can, I, I won't mention anything more. Um, perhaps the patients will understand the complexities of trying to give an individualized treatment rather than one size fits all. So you've touched upon it, Winston. So our next social media live is with you and with David, uh, Dr. David Nunns. Um, and that's going to be on Wednesday, the 10th of February at 7pm. Um, tell us a little bit, just a light overview of what you'll be covering in that social media live. From experience, most of my patients with a vulval pain have seen numerous of spe specialists and uh, they're just at their tether just going from one specialist to another and it's very e easy to come into a, a into a clinic uh, uh, where you're hoping this is going to be the miracle clinic mm. so what i'm going to be discussing uh, in the next podcast is how uh, can a patient with vulval pain who is going to see a pelvic pain specialist can prepare themselves before they get there and a checklist so that they can leave that consultation with what they want rather than what the doctor wants from that uh, uh, interaction. So that's what I'll be discussing uh, next time. It's so different from what Mr. Nunn does as a gynecologist. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's, but we're all looking at the same thing, but from a different perspective. And I think the exciting thing about pain medicine is we don't treat pain, we look at function. So we look at people more holistically. Yeah. And it is important, that holistic um, approach. And someone said they've seen, um, I think, let me just find the comment. I think they've seen a dermatologist who said one thing and then saw a gynecologist who said another. And the conflicting opinions is confusing and stressful. So I'd recommend if, if you've had that experience to tune in next time so that you can get a, a kind of more of an overview of um, different different types of care uh, and what might be available to you, what might be appropriate that that might give you a better idea. Um, really, really looking forward to that discussion between you and David um, and, and kind of looking at those key differences as well and, and why that matters. Uh, there may be a chance in, in that social media live and the ones going forward um, 
for some questions to be answered, uh, providing they're not too specific. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is uh, help a broad range of people as possible who are watching. If we don't get around to answering a question, um, you can email us again, providing it's, it's not too specific and it, it is general, um, then um, we may be able to answer that for you or point you in a particular direction. You can email us info, I-N-F-O, at vulvalpainsociety.org. Um, and I'll pop that into the comments so that you have that there. Okay. Um, and you can also find more information. There is someone's mentioned um, that we have plenty of resources on our existing website. Um, we do, I'm really glad you find it useful. Um, do feel free to go and have a look around. As I say, we are in the process, or Catherine's in the process of taking all of that stuff and putting it onto the new framework. Um, you can access it on a mobile, but it might not be as 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 great to, to access on, on it um, at the moment. However, you can access um, the information on there. It might not look as great as we might like it to, but we are getting there. That will be happening this year. Um, so I think um, on that note, I'm going to bring everyone back uh, to, well, to say kind of a, a, a final good night for tonight and any final words. I just wanted to thank anybody who's watched or who will maybe watch it um, afterwards because there will be people who can't watch live but will watch on catch up. Um, Sharon, this is going on to our YouTube channel as well, isn't it? It's already on YouTube. Yeah, it's streaming okay. on YouTube as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, just thank you. And Sharon, thank you for all your expertise and for uh, putting our webinars together last year when lockdown started. Um, and for you know all the all the technical expertise as well as your um, cognitive behavioural, your uh, cognitive hypnotherapy, your knowledge of pain science, which really keeps us on track as well. Thanks. Well, a little clap to pain science, you know. <laughs> Um, so well, we've all got different areas, so it works quite well. Yeah. You know, if you combine yeah. everybody, it sort of works quite well. Absolutely, and we are a team, and we work really well together. Um, you can check out our videos on our YouTube channel. I think Catherine's popped that into the into the chat, um, and I'll I'll pop it up as well. Um, so there are 10 videos on there. They're recordings of the live Q&As we did last year with guest experts, um, multidisciplinary experts, um, really useful uh, videos. So check those out. Um, thank you, everyone who's been watching live. And thank you, everyone who will watch this on the replay at your own convenience um, for watching. Uh, check out, feel free to email us, check out our website, check out our YouTube channel, and hopefully we will see you back here with Dr. David Nunns, Dr. Winston DeMello for, um, I was going to say a face off, but it's not that, it's going to be a lovely discussion, um, back here on Wednesday the 10th of February at 7pm. Thank you everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.